Yeah. So, hi everyone. Welcome to the Google Summer of Code Introductory Seminar 2022, organized by COS, Kharagpur Open Source Society. So, we'll get right into it. What exactly is GSOC or Google Summer of Code? What GSOC is can be best described as a summer program wherein students and working professionals participate in open source software development during the summer. This program is online and an international program conducted by Google. So what happens in GSOC is that contributors who have been who have applied and who have been selected work for an open source software organization during the summer and they earn a stipend for successfully completing the project that they have taken. These contributors spend their time outside of school or their job working in a field that can help them with their studies and career after university. So how does GSOC actually work? Firstly, open source software projects apply to be mentor organizations to Google. From these applications, Google chooses the organizations that have been selected to become mentor organizations. In 2021, this number was over 200. To these organizations, contributors subject submit project proposals and from these project proposals, contributors are selected. So mentor organizations choose the proposals that they would like to accept. And the selected contributors are then paired with a mentor who will help them and guide them throughout their project. Once this mentor allocation is completed, the coding period begins where the contributors work towards milestones that they have laid down in their project proposal. And they work with their mentor for a period of over 12 weeks. The mentor during this period will guide them, instruct them and help them out to complete their project proposal. So how does evaluations work in GSOC? There are two evaluations for each project which contributors must pass. Contributors who pass each evaluation are paid a stipend for their work. The two evaluations are a mid eval and a final evaluation. At the conclusion of GSOC, the contributors submit the code that they have written for their project for everyone to see and use. And this is one of the really cool things about GSOC is that once you've completed your project and submitted your code, this is there for other people to continuously use, to see, to interact with, and to modify as per their own needs. So this essentially becomes a part of the open source community. So coming to the eligibility criteria, this has been changed by Google this year. And until last year, it was only university students or recent graduates. But now the eligibility has been changed to include working professionals as well. The final, the current criteria is now only first, you need to be over 18 upon registration. Secondly, you need to be eligible to work in the country in which you reside. And thirdly, you must have participated in no more than one previous GSA, which means that each person can, can participate as a contributor in only up to two GSOCs. After this, you can contribute as a mentor, which is something we'll discuss further. There's also an unsaid rule that you need to have this willingness and enthusiasm to learn new things. This is extremely important for firstly your project to actually be selected and secondly for you to be able to complete your project in the stipulated duration. So coming to things that you don't need to be for getting selected into GSOC. First, you absolutely don't need to be a DASI. GSOC does not require you to be, say, a DASI or excellent in your academics, and there's really no bearing. So you can apply and you can get selected no matter what your current academic performance has been. You also don't need to be a student of the CSE department, which is a misconception that a lot of people have that, okay, I'm not in the CSE department. How will I do GSOC? I won't get selected. Things of that nature. This is absolutely untrue. You only need to have this willingness and enthusiasm to learn. And with your hard work, you can definitely send in a great project proposal and get accepted. And there are definitely lots of students who have been selected previously from other various departments, which is also something we'll be telling you about. You also don't need to be a competitive coder. There are definitely certain projects where data, science, data structures and algorithms might be really useful, but there are definitely a lot of projects such as front-end development projects where DSA is not something you require, and therefore being a competitive coder is absolutely not a prerequisite. You also don't need to be an expert level programmer. The thing in GSOC is that there are various organizations which have different projects and ideas, which means you can apply for one at your own level, and you don't need to be an expert in any field uh, or even in programming to get selected in GSOC. So coming to some statistics, GSOC has been happening for 17 years now, and we're in the 18th iteration currently. In these 17 years, over 18,000 students have been accepted into GSOC who have come from 112 countries. As of 2020, the three countries with the most students are first, India with 2,800 students, 
second United States with 2300 students and third Germany with 772 students. Or in GSA 2020, 77.5% of the students accepted were undergraduate students. And they were from various branches, including electrical, mechanical, biology, mathematics, civil, chemical, and so many more, which again shows you that you don't need to be a graduate student or pursuing a PhD, and neither do you need to be a computer science engineering student to get selected into GSOC. Um, coming to the mentors that were former GSOC students, about 25% of the mentors last year were former GSOC students, and this number is 530. So once you've completed GSOC as a student, being a mentor is also something you can consider. And having completed a GSOC, you get a great advantage as you're already familiar with the organization, you have worked with them. This is also something we'll be discussing. So here are some useful links for anyone who wants to find out more about GSOC or choose to apply. Firstly, there is the program site itself. There is a student manual that's written by Google itself. And finally, there's the Google open source blog. All of these URLs will be available in the slides that we'll be sharing soon after the event. So this year, the timeline has also been changed. Now there are two project sizes. Firstly, there's the medium project size and there's a large project size. Both of these projects, both of these types of projects have different timelines. Uh, so we'll discuss the standard timeline first. On March 7th, the organizations that have been selected to be mentors are announced. In the period April 4th to 19th, contributors can submit their project proposals to these organizations. On May 20th, the accepted contributors are announced and they are paired with their mentors. In May 20th to June 12th, um, there's the community bonding period with these organizations where you are encouraged to interact with your mentor, to interact with the open source community and organization that you have been selected as a part of, to explore the code base, to ask questions and so on. We'll also be telling you other specific things you should do in this period. But in general, we highly recommend you to interact and be engaged with your mentor during this period. From June 13 to September 12th is the standard coding period where students code away their summer trying to complete the project as per their own set deadlines. On September 20th, the initial results are announced for the medium length projects. After September 12th, which is the um, standard coding period, the coding period can be extended to up to November 21st in the extended timeline. This is something that you need to discuss with your mentor and apply for a timeline extension depending on the size of your project. Um, the date for the final results has not been declared yet, but it will probably be within a week from November 21. So this is the extended timeline for GSOC this year. So coming to the real reason we're all here, the perks of GSOC. Let's talk about what you get from GSOC aside from the things that you already probably know. Firstly, you get unparalleled software development skills and exposure to certain fields. Realize that when you work in GSOC, you get to engage with this extremely large community and an extremely large open source organization. So you learn how to work in large code bases. You learn how to interact with a team. You learn how to follow community guidelines and so on. Such exposure is really difficult to get it as an undergraduate student. And GSOC is an excellent experience to get um, this. You also get a stipend. Which can be between, which is between 1,500 USD for a medium pro size project and 3,000 US dollars for a large size project. You can multiply this later by the exchange rate, but you'll find that the um, stipend for medium size project is around 1.1 lakhs, and for a large size project is around 2.25 lakhs, which are pretty respectable sums for an undergraduate student. After GSOC, also you get a lot of perks and benefits. Um, depending on the organization you've worked with, you can get several contacts in the form of your mentors and people you have interacted with. And depending on the organization, if you have interacted with the professor and so on, you can also get letters of recommendation that you can mention. If your organization is a research-based organization, you can also publish papers that you've worked on over the summer. And you can even be invited to talks and conferences, which is something really cool and something you can mention on your CV or resume. You also get a level of community interaction that is simply unparalleled in something like a corporate internship. Other such perks and examples are um, being invited to talks and lectures. So here we can see an alumnus of COS who has also cracked GSOC, Mr. Himanshu Mishra. He was invited to give this talk on graph theory and its applications alongside two professors and another person who works in industry. Here is another example. Mr. Shivam Kumar Jha was invited to this student developer speaker event at IIIT Allahabad. Again, these are excellent experiences and things you get 
um, as a result of being part of GSOC and the open source community in general. So now let's talk about the introduction to free and open source software, what this really is. I'll be handing over to Likhit, who will continue from here. Yeah, I think Likhit has some issues. So maybe he can continue later. I'll continue for now. So coming to what free and open source software is, um, free and open source software is this field where GSOC takes place, which is what um, we work in GSOC. So I'll be continuing from here, Likhit, if you can. Yeah, so what exactly is free and open source software? Realize that any software you use, such as MS Teams that you're using currently, can be of two types in general. It can be open source software or proprietary software. So taking the example of MS Teams again, is it possible for all of us to view the, the source code for MS Teams? It's not, unless we are working at Microsoft or our developers for Microsoft Teams. The reason for this is that these are this is proprietary software or proprietary code that Microsoft has not decided to release to the public. So to actually view this, you need to be a member of Microsoft. This is in contrast to open source software where anyone anywhere can access the source code and work with it in any way they want. Another example for this is Google Chrome versus Mozilla Firefox. Google Chrome is a closed source or proprietary software and the source code is not available to everyone versus Microsoft versus Mozilla Firefox, which is an open source software and anyone can interact with the source code and view it. Depending on the license that open source software uses, you may be able to use the software in your own way for some commercial applications, or you may be allowed to modify the source code and redistribute it in any way you like. And these things may be restricted also, depending on the license that the software is using. So does anyone recognize any of these two logos? If you can recognize them, I highly recommend you drop them in the chat. So I think some of you would already know. The one on the left is GNU, and the one on the right is Linux. Both of these are um, both of these are uh, huge projects or organizations in the open source space, and we'll be seeing how you can actually work with these organizations or how you can contribute to them in GSAP. What essentially they are doing is that they have developed a lot of code that is being used and they have open sourced it for everyone to use. So coming to the history of FOSS, um, in 1970s, what used to happen is that com companies would give their software and their hardware to users and the users can look into this and modify this as they need it. One, one person, a programmer at the MIT AI lab, Mr. Richard Stallman, couldn't modify the new printer to notify of jams because its source wasn't available. So he decided that this is something that needs to be changed, that people need to be able to access the source code and they need to be able to interact in the way they see fit. So in 1985, the Free Software Foundation was formed and component by component, they began to create a clone of the Unix operating system, which is called GNU. So GNU stands for GNU is not Unix. This is a recursive acronym where GNU appears in its own expansion. 
um, this free software foundation tried to develop an open source alternative to the Unix operating system, which was really popular at that time. In 1991, a person, Linus Torvalds, wrote an operating system kernel called Linux. What a kernel is, is that it's a part of an operating system that enables basic software hardware communication. And this was a great leap for um, open source organizations and open source in general when the Linux kernel was created and open sourced. In 1992, Linux was integrated with the rest of the GNU project and it became known as GNU Linux, which is something a lot of you know these days. And distributions of GNU Linux are used all over the world in the form of Ubuntu, Debian, and other such um, distribution that you may have heard of. POS today is again extremely popular and it's being um, increased in its use. And realize that 100% of the current sub supercomputers we have run Linux, which is, as I mentioned, an open source software. And I think this is a really cool thing that even though com companies have developed operating systems like Windows and others, um, they still haven't been able to replace Linux for use in supercomputers. Also, the most popular mobile OS, Android, runs on open source software. And other companies these days are also adopting open source software as something that they want to work in. A lot of Silicon Valley and startups run on FOSS, and they also create their own projects and open source them as they see fit. Organizations like Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Microsoft recently, um, they ship open source software and they have contributed to several libraries that their programs depend on. Google Search open source their core machine learning library, TensorFlow, which is something that a lot of you may have heard of. Uber uses Requests, which is an open source Python library. Facebook developed Hive and PyTorch, which are again, really popular Python libraries that are being used. All of these libraries have been open sourced by these organizations in a way of giving back to the community, in a way of inculcating this open source culture where anyone can contribute to this code base, where everyone can get involved and so on. There's a really famous quote by Eric S. Raymond, which is given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, which essentially means that the more programmers you have, the more people you have looking at the source code, the better the code is going to be because these bugs can be found instantly and people can use their various specializations and their interests and contribute to the code in really interesting ways. Coming to some statistics, at the Linux Foundation, we currently have over 7.4 lakh contributing developers. We have 18,000 companies that contribute to the Linux Foundation. We have 30.6 million lines of code that is added weekly, and 14.6 million codes, lines of code that is deleted weekly as well. Um, the Linux Foundation also has 13,000 repositories at this time, which really tells you the scale at which these organizations work and how popular and how important open source is in today's world. So we've been talking about free and open source software. What we really need to understand now what this free actually means. This free is a free as in free speech, as in a freedom of speech and expression, and not a free as in a free beer that someone has written this code and given it to me for free. What free software really needs is four principles of freedom. And this is something that needs to follow. The first principle is that the freedom to run the program as you wish and for any purpose which means that the code as distributed can be used by the end user in whatever way they want and for whatever purpose they want. Secondly, the end user should also have the freedom to study how the program works and to modify it or change it so it does what the end user wants it to do. The third freedom is to redistribute copies so you can help your neighbor, you can help people, and you can share the source code to anyone and they can also use the software. The final principle is that the freedom to distribute copies of your modified version. So I can take any open source software, I can improve it, and if, if the software is free, then I can share this improved version or this different version that solves my specific problem to others and I can help them solve their own problems. Yeah, so here are some books and additional readings that you can check out. Um, all of these will be available in the slides, so you can go through it at your own convenience. And these are freely available online. The first is Free Software, Free Society. And this is by Richard Stallman, who is an extremely important figure in the open source community. There is also The Cathedral and the Bazaar, a book by Eric Raymond. And this talks about the history of GNU, Linux, and so on. There's also this documentary called Revolution OS, 
which is really interesting and you can check it out if you prefer documentaries to readings and finally there's a book free as in freedom by richard stallman so so far we've covered um, free and open source software and we've told you a lot about google summer of code at this point i'm sure a lot of you want to participate and want to come want to contribute to open source so how do you actually go about it so let's start talking about how you should select organization to send your project proposals to here are some general pointers realize that there are going to be over 200 or around 200 um, pro open source organizations each year so what you should definitely do is browse through all of them and you should filter them by things of your interest this can be your field of interest such as physics or astronomy or just machine learning and so on and also you should filter down by your tech stack what languages you are comfortable working with what frameworks you have previously worked with and what paradigms you want to explore after doing this first stage of filtration you should have about 50 organizations in this first iteration what you should then do is look through these project descriptions look through the project ideas that they currently have and the projects that were that were used in the previous years all this information is available on the gsoc website in the program archive we'll also be sharing a link to this once you go through these projects you can find um projects that interest you projects that also lie in your interest and also in your sort of core competencies things that you can do and things that you're confident you can be good at in doing this you should be able to filter down these organizations to a list about seven to eight you should be visiting these seven to eight organizations in great detail to finally get to the organizations that you want to submit a proposal to how you do this is by getting involved in these organizations by reaching out to their communication channels and interacting with the community most organizations generally have things like gitter channels or slack workspaces or mailing list that you can join and links are available on their website or generally on github you should definitely join these organizations you should interact with people you should have a look at the code base and understand what the organization is actually doing currently and whether this interests you or not you should also look at your skill level and see if this organization is appropriate for it after doing this you should boil down this further and perhaps even talk to some kgp seniors who are also present in this meet and they'll be addressing you later after doing this you should boil down your list to maybe two or three organizations from these organizations you should try to cut it down to one but or also two organizations to which you actually submit proposals you can submit a maximum of three proposals in a year to same or different organizations and timeline is something you should be also aware of whether you want to work on a medium sized project or large sized project and whether you have the time to devote 12 or 22 weeks after doing this you should be um, ready with the project or the organization you want to work with so coming to a demo for how to select projects once you have decided on an organization these are some tips that will come in handy and we'll also have seniors who will give you more advanced tips first you should use archives to see which organizations get selected every year in general there are two types of organizations those that come each year and are selected such as the python software foundation or num focus and other organizations and there are also organizations that have come for this year for the first time both of these are important and you should be looking into both of these why organizations that have come before are important are that you already have a benchmark you know the kind of proposals that have been accepted for this organization the kind of projects that have been accepted so you can build on this and you can use these as previous resources it's also important to know about the organizations that are coming this year for the first time um, because a lot of people may not explore these organizations and thus you're able to get into these organizations easily if you have a great proposal you should be definitely looking into both of these and seeing where your interest lies you should also choose projects which are the intersection of your field and computer science so for example if you're in a chemistry field and you're interested in chemistry you can go for an organization such as open chemistry and we'll be giving you examples on this later and we'll also be giving you some pointers on this by choosing your field of interest you also get a head start and you can thus sell yourself better and have a head start on others who may be applying to this organization it's also advisable to look through organizations such as those for programming languages like the python software foundation and julia as these projects have as these organizations have projects from diverse fields such as mathematics finance physics biotechnology chemistry and many others so you can easily find a project that interests you and is also part of your um, core competency area it is recommended that you do not choose university organizations and you do not choose organizations that are solely related to machine learning deep learning or ai unless you're an expert in this field 
we don't mean to discourage you from trying for these organizations but you should realize that you'll be competing with ms or phd students and they are generally going to have an edge over you so only if you're really confident should you try to apply to these organizations so here are some examples of organizations in different fields in finance we have python which is an umbrella organization so each year there are some umbrella organizations that come and within these organizations there are various projects in different fields so you should definitely be aware of these umbrella organizations and you should be aware which project you'll be working with and which code base you'll actually be contributing to for biotechnology we have several organizations like num focus the global alliance for genomics and health open genome genome informatics and so on for geoinformatics there is osgeo and 52 degrees north initiative for chemistry there's open chemistry for mathematics there are several organizations and thus you can look through your interest and see which organizations you should apply to also this does not mean that you need to be an expert at chemistry say to apply to open chemistry it means that open chemistry may have certain projects that are highly involved in chemistry and it may also have some projects that are that don't have all that much to do with chemistry and they may have something to do with say machine learning so it's recommended that for each organization you look through all their projects and even if you're not interested in the sort of core field of that organization you can um, check out uh, any other projects that they may have that may not require this kind of special knowledge uh one sec slides yeah uh, these are again some examples you can check out for different fields and you can also go to the gsoc website and filter by your interests gsoc has a filter and a search feature so what do you do after selecting an organization and a project this is these are going to be tips for how you actually get your project proposal selected and also how you are able to complete your project in time firstly it's very very important that all of you interact with the community and become familiar with your mentors and the other contributors by doing this you are also creating channels um so that you are able to get help and also you are being you're getting yourself known in the community you're becoming a part of it which also increases the chance of you getting selected in gsoc you should also start solving some beginner level issues you can go through the issue tracker of the repository generally available on github you can go through these issues that are labeled as good first issue or things or things like help wanted which are generally issues designed to get first contributors involved in the project and to give you a nice entry point into the organization by doing this you also increase your chance of getting selected and it's generally a good idea to have made a substantial contribution before sending in your proposal you should also once you have established this kind of contact with mentors in the organization it's a great idea to submit a sample proposal and tell them the kind of things that you want to work with what these mentors can then do is give you feedback on how to improve your proposal which again increases the chance of getting selected in this organization they are also going to tell you the things that they want to see from you and the things that they expect in the proposal which is something you should definitely keep in mind when submitting your proposal another thing you should be doing is that after submitting your proposal you should stay involved you should not disappear from the organization at this point this is the time when they are reviewing your proposals and hence it is critical to be active in the irc channel and be involved and be a part of the community and show them that you are trying to really contribute to this and you are really interested this is something that you can do to create a great impression and increase the chances of being selected so now coming to some basic do's and don'ts don't um ask vague or generic questions by this we don't mean you should hesitate to ask questions but you should phrase your questions intelligently you should do your own research and don't ask very basic questions we, you what you should ideally do is explore a question in your own time try to research and go through their recommended reading material and only when you aren't able to solve the question should you reach out for help at this point also you should drill down into the very specific issue you have instead of asking a broad or open ended question what you should also not do is expect instantaneous replies and you try not to badger these people or your mentors you should generally avoid personally mailing or dming your mentors but this is something that depends on the organization and you should check the guidelines or clarify if this is something that they encourage or discourage also don't try to write follow up or um, just badger people if you don't get a reply instantaneously this is because these are 
great people and they are generally quite busy with a lot of work that they may have they are there to help you and they definitely want to help you and they will get to you when and as and when their schedule allows them so badgering people is definitely something you should avoid doing another thing you should not do is ask to ask questions so don't say things like may i ask a question this is something that's going to waste time on both ends as they have to reply to you yes you may ask your question just be direct but ask smart questions also understand that they are there to help you and that you should also try to be helpful back to them don't try to undermine other applicants who may be working aside with you and also try to seem helpful in the community another thing you should do is being persistent when we say be persistent we don't mean badgering people or just being stuck on a single issue what we mean is staying on an issue by exploring different resources by going through reading material that your mentor may have shared by exploring the code base in your time and trying to figure out how you can solve these particular issues when you need then definitely you should ask for help by asking intelligent questions you should also be active on the slack irc or gitter channels or in the mailing list by doing so you make yourself visible and make yourself a part of the community which increases the chance of you getting help you should also research your questions thoroughly and we have included a link here which is the cat b guide to ask intelligent questions it is highly recommended all of you go through this both for gsoc and your work in other societies or organizations and asking great questions is definitely a skill all of you should have and this will definitely help you get help really fast also if you don't get an answer to specific questions especially those related to programming you should try asking on platforms such as stack overflow a lot of you may know these platforms but for some, those of you who don't know stack overflow is essentially a forum where people can post their doubts and questions and they can get help from community members stack overflow also has a set of guidelines for asking questions and you are highly advised to go through these guidelines another thing that you should do is help others and try to answer doubts as and when you can what this does is firstly it also creates a great impression and allows you to get help but secondly it clears your own concepts and gives you a nice way to explore the code base and develop your concepts which makes it easier for you to contribute and makes it more likely that you are able to complete your project proposal in time so having discussed some basic do's and don'ts i'll be discussing some basic proposal drafting advice and you'll be getting some advanced tips from seniors at the end of the session so something that you should be doing is look through previous years proposals for the organizations that have been there in the previous years like i mentioned all of these are available in the program archive on the gsoc website often organizations and mentors also have a specific set of questions or expectations that you should definitely include your in your proposal try your best to answer these questions and include as many of their expectations and check all of the boxes that you can a basic structure includes first an about me section where you talk about who you are and what you're doing second you talk about your previous relevant open source contributions how you're a part of the community and what you've done so far third you talk about why you're suitable for the project and why you want to work on this project all of these three things together should make up only about 20 to 30% of your proposal and the majority of it should be spent exploring the project idea itself sometimes organizations also have a page limit and it's really important that you adhere to this page limit strictly coming to actually explain the project you should start off with motivation which is why you want to work on the project and also why someone who will you and why someone wants to use this project what is the use case for this what do your users look like and why this is important for the open source community or the open source organization in general you should also be talking about a plan what you want to do and how you are actually going to go about this when doing so you also want to talk about execution details things like blog posts that you're going to refer to documentation that you're going to write and read um whatever tutorials or code base exploration you're going to do and so on you should also talk about your relevant experience and what tech stack you're going to be using to implement this another thing that's really critical is a timeline in gsoc you decide your own timeline which means you have this kind of freedom at the same time you have this responsibility to choose an appropriate timeline the timeline should actually achieve something for the organization and it should not be really easy but also it should not be extremely difficult and it should be an achievable timeline this is something you need to choose very carefully because you'll be graded and evaluated based on the completion of your own timeline you should also mention any other commitments you may have which allows your mentor to appropriately assess your timeline 
and give you pointers of feedback on how to change uh, or any changes that may need to be done. So here are some links um, that you can refer to once we've shared the slides. Here are again some recommended materials. We've already shared with you the link for the official student guide by Google. There is also an unofficial GSOC FAQ by Himanshu Mishra, an alumnus of COS who has also done GSOC previously. There is also this um, blog post tips for your GSOC application by a professor at MIT. And there's also a blog post by Mr. Shivam Kumar Jha, a current advisor at COS. All these links will be available in the slides we share. So if you're interested in GSOC, but you don't get selected, or if you find that a different format might be more suitable for you, there are other programs that are similar to GSOC and in the open source space that are distinct and you can try out for them. Some of the popular ones are the MLH Open Source Fellowship, the Season of Bitcoin, and the Julia Summer of Code. There are also some programs to encourage women participation in this open source community, such as the Rails Girls Summer of Code and Outreachy. These are some programs you can explore as well. So let's now talk about the history of GSOC from IIT Kharagpur. IIT Kharagpur has had a great history in GSOC selections and we've had consistently a very large number of selections. In 2016, we had 15 selections, which increased to 31 in 2017 by over doubling. And since then we've maintained a pretty great streak. And in 2021, we had 17 selections. As you can see in 2021, um, ID Kharagpur was one of the top 10 organizations with the most number of students with 17 selections. We were also part of this top 10 in 2019 with 19 selections. So these high counts of selections really go to show you the kind of culture that exists in IIT Kharagpur for doing GSOC and how you can get help through seniors, both in COS and outside. And so now we have some seniors in COS who will be sharing their own GSOC stories. So I'd like to invite Shivam if you're here. I think Yash is here. Yash can, yeah. if you can go ahead. Uh, sure. Okay. Yash, uh, over to you. First of all, am I audible? Uh, yeah, yeah, you're audible. Yes. Uh, great. Uh, so let me first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Yash and I'm a final year undergraduate student at IIT Kharagpur. So I'm pursuing mathematics and computing as my major and I will I would be soon graduating uh, like uh, from IIT Kharagpur like in the month of June. So uh, most uh, so let's talk about uh, like my OSS journey and like how I got started with that. So like first of all, uh, specific to GSOC, uh, make sure that uh, you have your own incentive uh, that why you want to like participate in GSOC. Is it due to the money or do you want to actually learn something or do you want to pursue software engineering as a career? So make sure uh, all of your uh, like uh, you have a, a clarity and your motivations like all sorted up like why you want to actually pursue GSOC. And once that is done, so uh, like you could take a look at a uh, lot of open source programs that we have. Uh, I think uh, it was shared in these slides. I could like uh, I will share my blog. I have like listed a lot of uh, resources as well. So you could take a look as well. And uh, that is just to make sure that uh, GSOC is not the only uh, like OSS program that is out there. There are a lot of other programs as well. So you could uh, basically just focus on the projects that you would love to work on and the organizations that you have chosen. And there are a lot of OSS programs uh, which would actually like fund uh, the work that you are doing. Uh, great. Uh, so let me talk about my journey with GSOC, like I, how I got started. So uh, basically like my rule of thumb was uh, to select an organization which is like kind of, uh, which actually takes in, uh, which has some, uh, uh, like background for uh, IT Kharagpur people. So like I just went through Meta KGP and I took a look at, okay, which of the organizations uh, selected IT KGP folks. So that was one of the way uh, which I chose my organization. And uh, I like did my GSOC with Open Astronomy, which is an organization for astronomy. So that was uh, 
kind of a like interesting experience for me because i learned lot of aspects of software engineering and uh, i quickly understood that uh, it's not about writing code it's uh, a lot about uh, like non technical things such as like communicating your ideas and using few words to express your like uh, thoughts uh, it, it is easy to like ramble a lot and then miss out the point altogether so make sure that uh, you write cohesively and like talk with people in a cohesive manner so that is important and then there are a lot of aspects of software engineering so let's say you submit a uh, like a patch or a pull request uh, to the organization and the mentors who are like actually maintaining the code they will review your code they will have some suggestions that you should write the code in this manner or in that manner and code read readability like uh, the code that you are writing is it readable uh, can i remember after 10 years what i have written so that is important so it's about uh, writing uh, it's about having all of these like nitpickings uh, in place so that uh, uh, the code is maintainable and you don't incur technical debt uh, to maintain the code so these are some of the things which i learned and it was a like a fruitful experience for me so i would definitely suggest you to take a look at uh, like gsoc if you want to pursue a career in software engineering because that is uh, easily one of the best ways to head start your uh, like uh, technical skills for software engineering and let's see if you want to pursue research there are also organizations which help you out in uh, that, that field as well so let's say you want to do machine learning or deep learning then julia is one of the like best organizations there are other organizations as well i'm like forgetting uh, like the remaining ones but uh, you could get a head start uh, with your career or with any of the like uh, learnings that you want to have so definitely i would suggest you to take a look at gsoc and uh, let's say if you have any specific questions or if you want any like sessions uh, you could reach out to me uh, so like uh, let me share my so i did my gsoc in like 2018 uh, and uh, i also took part uh, as a mentor in 2019 and uh, i also took part in lfx so you could like take a look at this program as well in 2020 so uh, you could take a look as well uh, great uh, so shivam do you want to like carry forward yeah sure yash so uh, basically yash has already told most of the things i just want to uh, tell you two important things one is that uh, even uh, if you don't let's say in a in a scenario in the unfortunate scenario that you don't clear gsoc and or at any point if you feel you're not going to clear and if you still continue doing your uh, doing your preparation it really doesn't matter that on that day whether uh, you whether your name is in that result or not sorry whether your name is in that result or not what really matters is till that point you would have learned a lot of things that yash already told about how to write good code how to talk with people you will have a community to depend on whether you are selected into the gsoc part of that community or not and this really helps in the long run whether if we talk about basic things like internship or it's just about learning things in the long run and second is that uh, i'll not be taking much of your time but most of my experience i have already written so you can go to my uh, like uh, facebook account and just it would be some of the uh, like top post where you can see the gsoc collaboration article so that should be fine and we are definitely going to take questions towards the end so i will be here only Uh, Ishan, do we have anyone else, or we could like elaborate on some of the things yeah. that Tapas, we have? Yeah, Tapas, are you there in the meeting? Uh, Ishan, I think Tapas is not here. You can continue. All right. So, if either of you have anything to add, or we can move into questions. Okay. Yeah, we can move to the questions. Right. Uh -huh. So I'll just be reading some questions from the chat, and then you can answer them. Or would you like to read them yourself? uh yeah let me read through i have the list uh so oh, like, like let the person ask the question the person who you can, can yeah, unmute, unmute right mm, that could be also good 
Yeah, so that will be better if they themselves introduce themselves a bit and then ask the question. Yeah, Samay, you can go ahead with your question. Hello. Yeah, hi, Samay. Yes, hello. Uh, so my first question is in one of those advice PPT, uh, there was written do not skip out on tests, blogs and docs. So actually, what do we mean by do not skip out test blogs and docs? Uh, just one thing uh, before we answer this question that do tell us your name, uh, yes. department and year. OK, that will be helpful in answering the questions. OK, so I am Samay Saval from Mechanical Engineering and I am in my first year. Cool. Thanks. First time. Okay, yeah, no. uh, uh, let uh, me elaborate. Okay, uh, so basically, uh, the test actually refers to the let's say you have written a code, so you need to write some unit tests. So you can search in Google what are unit tests in software engineering, and then uh, let's say you have written a square function, so you need yes, to write. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Uh, okay, am I an audible? Yeah, you are audible, but what I'm saying is key. Ye yeah. first sem hai na, I'm pretty sure it's a unit test. Vagera, bol ke na. Like he'll just get confused. Okay. What I would say is ki, if you don't understand it, it's not important at this moment. Mujhe bhi pata tha ki unit test kya hota hai, jab mujhe likhna nahi pada. It's yeah. fine to not understand some of the things or be confused about it. There will be people who will help you out when you reach that stage. Okay, you are not at that stage. So like this is not the right question. I feel that. What do you say? Yes, yes. Mm. Chale, like like. Uh... Mostly क्या होता है ना software जो लिखा जाता है तो उसमें तीन part होता है test, code and docs documentation. So you can like take a look if you understand more, that would be better. Uh, okay but, and uh, being a newbie to coder, which language should I start learning? Okay, uh, so like मेरे को Python, so I prefer Python because it's like it writes like English, so you could start with Python. But then it also depends on your interest. Like if you like front end, if you like designing, then front end engineering is something you could take a look like JavaScript. So uh, make sure you like realize that ki kya karna hai, what are the things you want to do and then decide. And about C++? Uh, yes, so C++ is also like useful for uh, like uh, your course content. I think Algo DS ka course aata hai apna. So uh, you will like you will have to write in C++ or C. So uh, learning that is not a bad thing. So uh, if we know C++, we can register ourselves for GSOC, right? Yeah, you can look for projects based on C++. Okay. I'll just add to what Yash said is that if you do GSOC in C++, it is not going to be easy whether you are applying or whether you are like coding unless you are really good in gsoc uh, really good in c++ okay because gsoc is not your competitive coding where you will be set to code a matrix and then solve some path path algorithm okay mm -hmm. it involves a lot of things where if if i have to say that do you know anything about c++ that is used in gsoc i would say you know zero percent of that Okay, yeah, that's true. not to scare you, but what I mean is key. Unless you know what C++ really is when it's when it comes to software development, I would be if I were you, I would be very afraid to choose it. I would go for much simpler languages like JavaScript. Uh, not just to be specific on the back end uh, Python. Yeah, in general. Anything else, but not these core. Uh, hmm. Low level languages, yeah, not not these low level languages. Okay, and we should enroll in GSOC from second year, or we should still wait to improve our skills and then. On this, I would like you to read the eligibility criteria on the GSOC website. You will get to know when you can apply, how many times you can apply, and how many times you can do GSOC. Okay, so I guess you get the answer to your question there. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Sanan. Gaurav, you can go next. Uh, hello, Shivam. Yeah, hi, Gaurav. Yeah, yeah, I'm Gaurav. I'm, I'm presently in second year of Department Industrial and Systems Engineering. I was wondering whether I should pursue GSOC in the upcoming summer because I'm in a four year course and I will also be having CDC. So what are your views on this? 
Yash can answer this question better. Uh, yeah, uh, so like I will take my example. So I had my CDC and before that I also like uh, did an LFX mentorship. So it all depends on you. Uh, like, do you want to have the experience of open source mentorship? So it depends on you because CDC prep will take your like if CDC is one of your target that you are like uh, looking forward. So uh, it, it is time consuming and uh, I think it is better if you focus on one thing, um, but you could like squeeze out your time like uh, you need to maintain your calendar and make sure uh, you know how many hours you are like sitting for the project and then for the prep if you want to allocate some other time and yeah so it all depends on you actually so yeah it's kind of a trade-off you could do both but yeah it all uh, it actually affects your prep as well so uh, it's all uh, it's mostly about the trade-off uh, one more thing, uh, let, us, let me say that uh, whatever profile we will be having an internship, let's say via CDC, and also uh, if I can do a GSOC in the coming summers in the same profile. So, mm. uh, so will that actually be, help, be helpful for my compulsory internship like thing? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Your compulsory internships and GSOC are two exclusive things. There is no Common commonality between the two. So the uh, it's not like a formal requirement. Like if you want to have an internship, you should have GSOC. It's not a formal requirement. And neither you can use your GSOC as a formal internship. Hmm. Okay. But, but yeah, so it helps you like to develop skills, and uh, yeah. of course you could talk about it in your like uh, internship uh, interview or just you could like. Uh, carry forward the skills that you have. So that's definitely a plus point. Uh, right. I would agree. And also uh, one more thing. And also uh, whatever uh, in GSOC means whatever organization we are contributing, will that in any way help me get a corporate intern later next uh, next year? Maybe? No, it's not guaranteed. Yeah, that is a separate I, thing. Yeah, sorry, Ash, for cutting you. Continue, please. Yeah, that's a separate thing. Like in CDC, I have seen people who didn't had uh, any GSOC and they got a corporate intern and vice versa as well. You did GSOC and still it's difficult for you to get an internship. So both are uh, completely different things. And adding to what uh, you said is key, you may be able to get referral from people in your organization to really good companies. Mm -hmm. Like tomorrow, let's say you are in a good organization. Just in my CC extractor, so hmm. in there, uh, there are people who Bosch, Germany, me kaam karte. if I want referral from them, they will give me. So hmm. these things also help in our connection level. Ki you will have connection to such people. Like uh, okay, for me, you. like for me, I was working with Thanos, and that was like closely related with Grafana. It's uh, a startup, like you could take a look. So if if I wanted, I could have taken a referral to apply to Grafana. So yeah, it helps, but it's quite specific. Like it's not always true. Uh, okay, any thanks, Yash and Shivam. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think there's another Gaurav. You can go next. Yeah. yeah. So my name is Gaurav Patidar and I am in a web development team of Springfest. So I want to contribute in the field of web development. Or of you did something wrong. Can you please repeat? Uh, my name is Gaurav Patidar. Your department and your year, please. I am a se second year undergraduate student from the Department of Agriculture and Food Engineering enrolled in its dual degree course. And uh, I'm border of Azad all of residence. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> you could like, continue with the question. Uh, yeah, so my question was uh, that I am uh, uh, I, I want to contribute in the field of web development. So uh, can you tell me some organization which gives project on the uh, web development? Interesting. So Yash, would you like to answer? Or then I will tell you that the organization's website will be tag me search for web development. Or where will go? You can go ahead. Yeah. So I would say that basically uh, when organizations get released. What happens is uh, there are tags hota hai, hai? where you can see ki project is related. Hai. So there you will find tags related to web development such as back end, front end, 
ऑटोमेशन इन ऑल दीज एंड यू अकॉर्डिंग टू योर इंटरेस्ट वो टैग सेलेक्ट करके यू विल गेट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन और नॉट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन बट स्पेसिफिकली प्रोजेक्ट दैट आर इन दोज डोमेन सो दस दैट आंसर योर क्वेश्चन गौरव यस थैंक यू गौरव मयंक यू कैन गो नेक्स्ट हेलो एवरी वन आई एम मयंक सोनी फ्रॉम एक्सप्लोरेशन जियो फिजिक्स ब्रांच फर्स्ट ईयर सो माई मीन्स माई क्वेश्चन इज दैट आई रिसर्च सम समथिंग अबाउट जी सॉक एंड टॉक टू सम के जी पी सीनियर्स दे टोल्ड मी दैट टू टू मीन्स कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट ऑन प्रीवियस ईयर प्रोजेक्ट दैट आर अनकम्प्लीट लाइक दैट सो कैन यू प्लीज गिव एन ओवर व्यू रिगार्डिंग दैट I mean, uh, I did not understand your question. To be honest, like, what do you mean by overview? To work some on previous year projects that have already been, uh, mean like listed on GSOC. Yeah. So I mean, what do you mean by given overview? Like, what should I tell you? Means like, is it recommended? Means like they said that this will help in building a good proposal for that, and That's how true. to approach that. how to approach solving previous uh, year projects right means like he he said that uh, some of the projects are means like left incomplete yeah. so like you should uh, means work on that project like this will help uh, in building a good proposal for you hmm. interesting so there are two things that i like to tell you in this first is ki what what uh that individual meant is ki in some organizations what happens is there are some projects which are like continued through gsocs multiple gsocs okay like first me kuch part hua uh, if anyone is uncomfortable with hindi you can let me know so kuch parts me it would happen that some parts are done in one gsoc and then it's continued so in those if you start contributing earlier to uh such such unfinished or like projects that need work and are already established that is helpful definitely and the second thing is contributing in any manner to any organization is very helpful in your proposal because in the proposal there will be part where you will have to prove that show us your previous work that why we should trust you right and in that in those parts it will be very helpful if you have some good pr some good you know Conversations and comments to show that yes, you deserve it. So, uh, like, is it ne- only necessary or not? It's not necessary. It's necessary. You can just come. You can just wake up on the day of filing application and file a empty document. Nothing is necessary to file the uh, application. But everything you do do increases the probability of you getting selected. Am I right, Yash? so so may uh, like uh, to be fair you don't need to like pick up on a like uh, incomplete project if you want to like maximize your chances there are other ways to do that as well it's important that you understand the project and you have a conceptual clarity because effectively that is what you have to complete nothing else is required so make sure you choose the project which you understand and you have like a uh, history of contribution like you made some pull request during like two or three months that you have till march so that will actually give the mentors faith that okay this is the person who can like complete the job so that only matters nothing else uh, anything else okay. and you just have to prove it that in hmm. and the more work the more investment you do the the it, it just proves better that yes this person can do the work and that is all men- matters to any admin or the like the maintainer Mental. of the project who is going to select you exactly or uh, anything else no thank you okay uh, great yeah, yeah priyank you can go next yeah so hello everyone this is priyanshu i'm a first year undergraduate student from the department of ocean engineering and naval architecture yeah so like uh, i wanted to know that uh, i have had experience of python in class 11th and 12th like only the basics of python programming language so uh, can you please suggest me some sources over which i could just uh, go over and test my knowledge that if i'm capable for this or not like for applying in gsoc okay so 
do you want any place where you could like uh, sharpen your skills related to python yeah, so, yeah, like, yeah okay um so i might have to check out that i don't remember it now i i, I can like <coughs> share it with you or i would like it would be better because you need to develop these skills also that you need to find out work or like next task that you need to do because uh, when you will start working in organizations you will have to proactively find out things to do so what you can do here is uh, you you can go to the last year organization list sorted by the tag python or any language you want to see whether you can do it or not go to that project see that guys commit do you understand it if you understand it see if there are issues that you can solve or that you even understand if you don't understand or you have any confusion you can write in the comment that okay i want i'm interested in solving this or trying it out S that maintainer or any active person from the organization will guide you so they will this will have two benefits one you will understand your problem will be solved second is you will also get a flavor or like actual idea of how things work and that will be a good point for your uh proposal if you file it if you apply for gsoc okay okay i got you thank you so much i think someone has shared good first issues so you could also take a look at that that is also a good place to pick up python and then good first issues uh, okay. great uh, thank you Oh, yeah, Tanish, you can go ahead with your question. Yeah, hi. So my name is Tanish, uh, and I'm from CS department in my first year. So I'm confused with what exactly is going to go into the programming part. Uh, for example, if I used to go into an organization like Open Astronomy, hmm. um, exactly would I be required to do in the programming part? uh see uh, so you could like filter out the organization in the uh, gsoc website that we have then you would see there are list of issues like projects that you need to solve so let's say you find one fascinating so you can pick them up and then they will actually describe what actually needs to be done so like my project was to like revamp the api uh, so do you understand what is api application point interface or let's say you hit a url so there is some code which actually handles that uh, logic of the URL. Let's say gsoc slash home. So you need some code which handles the logic for slash home. So I needed to like uh, refactor the code of the backend that we had and also write some new test uh, suites that we had. So that was my project. So how did I understand that that needs to be done? So I read through the project details. I asked the mentors if I had any confusions and I made sure that I share my understanding with them. So that is what you uh, need to do to understand and get more clarity. Uh, so, did, you, did you participate in your first year? Uh, yeah, so I did take part in first year as well. Uh, so you did all the backend development in your first year. Did you have any prior uh, that? So uh, to be fair, it was kind of a process that went side by side so i did learn python in my first semester and at the same time i did take part in uh, kharagpur winter of code so i got an idea like how to contribute and like interact with people so that is where like uh, it's kind of a i did kind of a parallel processing kind of thing i was learning new things at the same time and i was trying to uh, contribute to projects but to be fair uh, later on i realized that it's better if you like uh, take one more year to understand the things at a more fundamental level. Like my latest project, it was much more enjoyable for me because I had a lot of clarity of the things that I'm doing and uh, things were making more sense. So yeah, that is why I'm focusing on that. Uh, but when you applied for the GSOC, mm -hmm. you, you didn't have much knowledge of what was going yeah. to go in. Okay. Yeah. So, to be fair, you could like spend more time to understand the project. Uh, uh, there are some projects which uh, you might have more understanding if you spend more time trying to learn new things, like uh, trying to understand the uh, logic of the system that is written and what are REST APIs. So, those are some of the things 
you can catch up if you like put in more hard work if you are more interested in like persisting through so yeah it all depends on person so to what person what was the in, uh, in the end project of the whole astronomy yeah so basically i rewrote the backend that we had and i uh, like rewrote the test cases so uh, you might uh, recall the event that we had uh, the photography of the black hole that we had so it actually used astropy uh, which is one open source package that we have and that actually uses uh, like uh, the open astronomy project that uh, which i wrote so effectively you could say that my project was related to that so the impact is like enormous you even don't know where it's going to be used but yeah it has lot of impact okay Thank yeah. you. Uh, any thing else? Anyone wants to ask? I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, so if I want to go into something like AI or machine learning, mm. but absolutely nothing, nothing knowledge prior of that, mm. could I? Sorry. Uh, I am losing your voice. Can you repeat the last part? If I. wanted to go into ai or machine mm -hmm. learning in the soc uh, would it be a good idea because i have little to no 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 knowledge of it but i have studied some mathematics and astronomy and i have a little knowledge of that so what should i be going for like uh, my project was not based on ai uh, to be fair uh, yeah if you want to go into field such as ai or ml or dl based projects like statistically speaking uh, the chances of a graduate student like getting through a, a ai based project is a bit uh, like bleak because effectively there are a lot of other things that we have and it's uh, difficult for uh, undergraduate student to learn those things if you could complete those things if you have a good understanding then uh, you are all automatically ahead of your peers that you have uh, so i think you could reach out to raj he is uh, like associated with cos uh, you could like search raj and cos or if you, you could reach out to me i will like share his uh, details so he also like tried similar thing that he wanted a computer vision project and at the same time uh, he was an undergraduate student so it was fairly difficult he still made it through but his uh, project was a research based he didn't actually like prepare a uh, kind of production level code like you could use it out of the box uh, his project was research based so that is something like he would be more like uh, knowledge is or he has more context about that so you could talk to him but yeah statistically speaking it's more difficult for undergraduate students than graduate students to get through okay thank you uh, shivam you want to add anything or नहीं नहीं आह फिर वो नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन या आह एनीवन वांट्स टू आस्क एनीथिंग एल्स आई थिंक दैट्स इट फॉर क्वेश्चंस आह एनीवन यू कैन रेज योर हैंड राइट नाउ इफ यू हैव एनी क्वेश्चंस या इवन इफ यू डोंट हैव एनी क्वेश्चंस राइट नाउ and if you go through our like written anything that yashmi or anyone else has written about gsoc or any video and if you find anything that you need to talk about you can definitely approach on our cos facebook page that oh. we would be definitely available for you yeah you could also personally reach out if you don't uh, like remember anything or you want to ask any specific questions Oh, great. I think that's mostly about the question and answers. Uh, Ishan, you want to take forward? Yeah, like yeah. I think Likhit can take over. Like, uh, even if you have questions later on, then you can always contact uh, the corresponding seniors. So, like, this is a meta KGP wiki link uh, about Google Summer of Code. So, like. Uh, it uh, has all the seniors who have previously completed their google summer of code you can check out for some resources or some contact points and so i thank everyone for attending the session i especially thank uh, shivam kumar ja and uh, 
yes sharma for uh, providing the gsoc stories and guiding uh, all the participants so like uh, if you have any feedback then you can always fill the form thank you for attending the session